Different media of Islamic art, uh, mostly objects of luxury art, came to uh, Europe, medieval Europe, including what is today uh, uh, Austria. One important period was the 13th and 14th centuries when Mongol rulers had uh, established a vast empire in peace across Asia that allowed long distance trade. It was at that time when diplomat travelers and merchants like the famous Marco Polo from Venice explored possibilities of trade and uh, of political relations with the Mongols. The trade with Asia made money and large money with luxury commodities and the most important was uh, textiles, highly prized and much sought after in Europe. Most highly valued were textiles uh, made of silk and woven with golden metal threads. The feeling and the visuality uh, of such silk and sparkling gold made an impression and needed a weaving technique also that were unknown in Europe at the time but were used and produced in large numbers and extremely high quality in the Mongol Empire. Such Mongol cloth of silk and gold survived only in few pieces and mostly in European churches, strangely, because here they were used only on special occasions. That means they were rarely used, they survived. Another European survival of such textiles is what is attested in Vienna in a royal burial made into the burial garment, in this case of uh, Rudolf IV, uh, the king uh, who died in 1365 and was buried in the crypt below uh, a very prominent place uh, below the main altar of the Cathedral of St. Stephen's in Vienna. We can say that this cloth of silk and gold and you see here a copy uh, that this cloth is remarkable and significant in three fields. Firstly, textile history in Islamic art. The Vienna cloth is the only surviving Mongol cloth of silk and gold that can be securely attributed to a specific time and place. The design shows three wide inscription bands with Arabic writing, you see such one band, framed by narrow strips uh, with hunting animals and a white pattern of lotus uh, flowers and small peacocks. The colors have faded away. Originally the golden pattern was on bright green, blue and red. The inscriptions repeat a text that wishes well-being and long rule. Praise to our Lord, the glorious Sultan, most glorious King of Kings, Highness of World and Religion, Bu Said Bahadur Khan, may God perpetuate his rule. These specific titles for this Sultan from the Mongol dynasty of the Ilkhans in Iran allows to say that the textile must have been made in the years between 1319 and 1335 AD. The striped design with uh, inscriptions is known from other surviving Mongol textiles. Unusual is that they are so large, so readability and also calligraphic quality are high. The text is by far longer than the short formulas in other known textiles. And there is another peculiarity, the direction of writing in all three bands of inscriptions turns at a point that uh, was probably in the middle of the cloth. We could establish this in our project with a reconstruction drawing. So that means the writing in one half of the text I was running and read from one short side and in the other half of the text upside down from the other short side. So this was a very specific uh, type of design made for a specific function and we can only speculate what this function was. It may have been tailored into a, but then very special, speci specific clothing or more probably used as a curtain or a fitting in architecture. In any case, this textile uh, served to clearly communicate uh, praise on the ruler so it had a representational quality, a representational function. 
Another point is the enormous quality of the textile compared to other known ones. This again points to royal context and production in a royal workshop. Uh, the golden metal thread is just one third of a millimeter in diameter. It is made of thin metal strips wound around a silk core and these strips are uh, of silver and fully gilded on both sides. The quality is also evident in the weaving of the long inscriptions. Normally patterns on a loom consist of small predefined units that are just repeated to create a larger pattern. Each unit uh, not much larger than a few centimeters, uh, such as is the case here in uh, the hunting freeze and uh, in the repeated unit of the white pattern, but uh, in the inscription bands the entire writing is an amazing one meter and 17 centimeters long before it starts to become repeated. So either no effort was spared to define and weave such uh, a long text or a specific technique was used that so far we do not understand. The second relevant field for the Vienna textile is that it demonstrates a specific European context of use and one that is entirely different from the use as costume or fitting at the court of a ruler in Iran and that shows how much it was appreciated in Europe. It was used in a royal Christian burial. Why a textile with Arabic inscriptions was used? One explanation that has been suggested is that Arabic lettering uh, was seen as a reference to the Holy Land or invested with a Christian meaning. We know of similar phenomena uh, with pseudo-Arabic letters in late medieval European painting, uh, in uh, paintings with Mary or other Christian themes. Another explanation is simply that cloth of silk and gold was considered the most luxurious and precious textile in the period. The stunning visual appearance of woven gold and intricate patterns in bright colors fitted a dead king. Nothing comparable was produced in Europe and only in the 14th century um, weavers in the city of Lucca started to produce similar golden textiles. Um, so in Europe as Mongols were called Tatars and the appreciation of Tatar golden textiles is reflected in literature of the period. The poets Dante, Boccaccio and Chaucer used the terms drapi uh, tatari, drapi tatareschi, kluf of tars, so in Italian or English, to denote rich and extravagant clothing. Before purple uh, denoted royal clothing in European literature, now it became cloth of gold. So the Vienna textile, along with other pieces, evidences a cultural transfer, a market change in the princely textile culture of Europe as the direct result of trade, import, lasting impact and appropriation of golden textiles from the Islamic and other regions of Asia. And thirdly, the Vienna textile allows to reflect on modern dealings with objects of Islamic art. It was in the 18th century that historic objects started to become recorded and documented. An examination in 1739, in this case, uh, recorded the burials in the crypt with drawings and a descriptive text and that was published in a book, so circulated, to be read by others. The early 20th century then saw the textile as a historic artifact. In 1933 it was taken out of the crypt, transferred to a museum newly founded for church art and studied for the first time. So it was historicized, aestheticized and musealized and the way it was framed and presented in a museum changed several times. First hanging at the wall, then laying flat in the corner of a dimly lit room that was uh, presented as a treasury chamber and today now in a huge glass case in the center of a white room surrounded by historically related objects.
The questions and frames of scholarly inquiry changed. The first publication in the 1930s situated the textile quickly in the blossoming historiography of Persian art. The late 1980s expanded to transregional and cross uh, Asian connections of textiles under Mongol rule, so brought that dimension inside. And the last step, our project with articles published after 2010, turned to a monographical study of the object and to this double focus of context on the uh, original textile in Iran and on the European use uh, in a princely burial in Vienna.